Coming up next in this week in computer hardware, no more cheap RAM. Prices are going up. Haswell Graphics revealed Seagate's new SSDs, AMD's secret new CPU, connecting six monitors and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 217, recorded May 9th, 2013. Upgrade your memory now, people. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Ting.com. Ting is a new mobile phone service that makes sense. Save money with Ting, pay for what you use doesn't require contract and offers unlimited devices on one pooled plan. To save $25 on your first Ting device, visit twitch.ting.com. That's twitch.ting.com. Welcome to Twitch. This week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you the most useful, important, well, news about computer hardware, tablets, occasionally cell phones, and quite frankly, we want to give you the best performance for the least amount of money, unless you have all the money, and we'll help you there, too. Ladies and gentlemen, joining me, as always, from Louisville, Kentucky, barely conscious after a whirlwind tour of the Canadia. Uh, we call that Canada, lest people get angry when I call it Canadia, the mythical land of the well. north. <laughs> Someone, a, a Canadian viewer of, of, of DLTV once got very, very upset that I refu referred to Canada as Canadia and literally uh, wrote me like a seven-page email <laughs> explaining what's profoundly disrespectful to our northern neighbor. But I still like the idea of a mythical land called Canadia, and I will risk the wrath of the Canadians because they are fine people. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ryan Trout. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you know, I'm really, it's, it's all right. It's, it was a, not a whirlwind. If you, if you call flying into Toronto and staying for 36 hours and flying right back a whirlwind tour, I guess I did that. I did go up top of that the CN, the CN tower, um, which used to be the tallest freestanding structure in, um, North America, I think, or maybe even the world up until like the two, the 2000 timeframe when, when the, the mad race to build the tallest buildings in the world commenced, uh, <laughs> And it has a rotating restaurant on the top of it, and that's about all I know about it. So, and then I can't Ryan cannot reveal who he was meeting with in Canada. I'm sure it was personal business. Um, uh, I can, t I can tell. There's only one. There's only one company in, in Toronto, and that, that I would deal with. It's A and D. So, but I, only I can't one tell you is what I talked about. So, okay. What we can talk about, some of the most depressing news I've had in weeks. Uh, the days of cheap RAM may be coming to a close, right? Jeremy Hellstrom up on PCPer.com. Why? Because demand is up, supply is down, because there was a, an exit, a glut of RAM in the market that drove prices down. We all got used to doing things like buying 8 gigabytes for $12. I exaggerate here for impact, but RAM was ridiculously inexpensive. Commenting on the issue, Acer Chairman JT Wang pointed out that DRAM prices are likely to continue rising. That means get more expensive. Which their production lines to manufacturing smartphone DRAM, leaving insufficient capacity to supply the PC industry. Even if DRAM makers decide to switch back capacity, it will still take about three to four months for the process to be completed. So if you've been on the fence about buying more RAM, you might want to buy it now because for the next few months, i.e. between now and the school year, the beginning of the, the next school year, it sounds like the prices are going to climb. Are you worried about this, Ryan, or is are you anticipating this? Have you, have you been stockpiling RAM along with ammunition and food for the, the apocalypse? Or? Uh, I think uh, the, the order has been RAM, food, ammunition. Uh, so yes, <laughs> lots of it here. I, you know, I don't know if I'd say I'm worried about it. It's, it's definitely, I mean, it's going to be a disappointment to see prices kind of go back up, but Ram has been ridiculously cheap. And I think if you're somebody that's upgraded recently uh, to 16 gigs or something like that, you're going to be fine for probably a year or two, at least down the road. Right. Um, the only kind of Potential hiccup would be if like DDR4 were, were, were to come out and be a dominant, a dominant player, but it will not, at least in, in, my, in my view of the future for the next year or so anyway. So I, I think if, you, if you're sitting on there and you're sitting looking at your system and you've got four gigs of memory and you see this news, now might be a good time to go buy that 16 gig kit and you know, just have it get a, get a good speed DDR3 16 gig kit. 
It'll work with AMD processors. It'll work with Intel processors. It'll give you some headroom going forward, and you won't have to worry about price increases. What's your sweet spot right now for, say, a basic Windows 8 desktop versus a, a you know, Windows 8 gaming machine versus a Windows 8? I mean, if, if you're editing video, editing audio, if you to have all of the, you know, everything on the planet running on your system simultaneously, then max out your RAM. If you're a video editor, max out your RAM. If you're working with gigantic RAW files, max out the RAM your system can take. Um, right. For everybody else, though, uh, you know, basic 3D gaming, uh, desktop users, I mean, I would like 8 as the basic load for any Windows 8 system. You know, do you need um, to go to 16 for gaming? No, you don't need to. I mean, it's 16 gig is kind of on the high end uh, of things, but I'm looking here, um, and it's it's just, where are we at here? Come on. It's not that expensive. Like, like, I'm up at Newegg, and I'm like, Patriot yeah. Viper 3, 16 gig, which is 2, 8 gigabyte sticks is $119. Kingston HyperX, uh, 16 gigabytes for $130. That's DDR3, 1600. Um, I mean, if you so, go down to like a, the AMD, ironically enough, has Radeon right. branded memory entertainment series, <laughs> 2 by 8 gig kits for ninety four ninety nine. DDR3 1600, okay. not aggressive timings, not aggressive voltages or anything like that. But for $95, you can get 16 gigs of memory um, still today. Eight gigs, you know, you, you're going to get under that. So, if, you know, if you're on a budget, I would say eight. But if, if like I said, if, if you're worried about memory prices, uh, just jump on that 16 gigs for 100 bucks or less for some of these models. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm looking at it and I see at least four, maybe five, uh, 99.99 or less, 16 right. gigs pairs like so two by eights even not even four by fours which should be a little bit less so um I, you don't need it but it's, it's it's if you're worried about it jump on it now and you can save it and reuse it later there you have it yeah intel announces haswell graphics details and new iris graphics i gotta say i'm actually getting excited about haswell i'm i uh, my my partner in crime uh, not veronica on texilla but robert uh, heron on texilla he is is unhinged in a desperate need to buy a new Ultrabook. And I'm like, dude, wait for Haswell. More battery life. Wait for Haswell. More battery life. Are, are you excited about Haswell? Will they, they reveal anything stunning about the graphics? Are they going to be on parity with discrete graphics in terms of 3D performance? Mm, still, so you know, there, there's, a, there's a split for me on whether or not I'm excited about this announcement. So they, they basically mm -hmm. kind of talked about graphics performance in a high level. They showed some 3D, 3D mark benchmarks, um, talked about some branding. So there will still be... Uh, where's the models? There's still Intel HD graphics 4000 series. So you have like the 4200, 4400, 4600. And then you still have Intel HD graphics 5000. And then you have Intel Iris graphics 5100 and Intel Iris Pro graphics 5200. And the only deviation between, so you would think Iris graphics would be, oh, this is all the, the newer GPU stuff, but it, it's not, simp not that simple. So the GT2 graphics configuration, which exists essentially in uh, Ivy Bridge today, mm -hmm. will be carried over into Haswell on desktop consumer, uh, you know, uh, DIY parts. That will be Intel HD graphics 4600, essentially. Uh, when you start getting into the mobile side of things, it gets more interesting. The Intel, Intel HD graphics 5000 is the 15-watt GT3. GT3 being twice as many compute units, but it'll run at lower clocks. So it's possible that the HD graphics 5000 may be just barely faster than the, than the 4600, depending on what the clock speeds are. And then GT3 with 28 watt, which basically as we increase TDPs, we're basically saying uh, the graphics is going to be able to run at higher clock speeds. Um, these are, this is obviously mainly for mobile configurations. You get into better performance there. And then the Iris Pro graphics, the 5200 <laughs> is the interesting one because it's GT3 graphics, twice the compute units, higher wattage, so you're going to get probably close to peak uh, frequencies. And then the E means that it has an embedded DRAM. It has an embedded extra level of cache on the chip, mm -hmm. not on the die, but on, on the chip and on the package, um, which is really cool. We're talking triple digit megabytes of embedded DRAM, which essentially is an L4 cache that the graphics will have access to. And this has the potential to improve graphics performance pretty dramatically. And not only that, but uh, if you use your laptop for stuff like video editing on the on the go, that extra level four cache will actually be beneficial to you for like the uh, uh, what do they call it the encoding engine 
from uh, um, Mercury Playback Engine, rather, from Adobe in their Premiere. And, and you're basically getting a, a pretty drastically large cache on, on the processor, something we haven't seen in a while. What's, what's kind of annoying about it is that there's not mm -hmm. going to be a discrete, that's not the right term, there's not going to be a desktop part that has GT3 graphics on it. And that's kind of a letdown, right? So if you're buying, if you're if you're planning on buying a Haswell processor, and you're like, well, it's going to have better graphics, I'll just buy the you know the 4770 or something like that. I can overclock it some, and then I can just use it in my home theater PC, you know, that I'm going to build. It, it's not going to be that much better. The graphics in Haswell will be a little bit better than they are in Ivy Bridge, but from GT2 to GT2 configuration, it's not going to be that dramatic. Um, if you look at the graphic there, uh, I'd say it's third from the top, maybe fourth from the top, called Incredible Desktop Graphics Performance. You'll see the 3770 compared to the 4770 compared to the 4770R. And right. um, what's interesting about the R part is that is actually a BGA package part, which means it's going to be soldered onto the boards when it leaves. You know, it, it, it's not going to be sold in a socket, I guess right. is the best way to say it. So this will be in all-in-one PCs. Um, it'll be in maybe embedded designs and that kind of stuff. But what's what's kind of annoying is that gra that bar on the right-hand side, way higher, up to three times the performance of Ivy Bridge. But they're right. limiting that today to, in my opinion, platforms that don't really need it or <laughs> don't need it any more than what a consumer might need. Now, what, what right. would maybe make this appealing and kind of make up for it is, if board vendors like Asus and MSI and Gigabyte sell like a, a thin mini ITX board with the 4770R on there for you to build your own, uh, you know, home theater design out of it or something like that, then that would be okay. You get the best graphics in the smallest form factor at a really good wattage level, 65 watt TDP, uh, and you can use it that way. I just think it's a little disappointing that there's not going to be a plug-in, you know, LGA 1150 version of uh, uh, the GT3 graphics as it stands now. So yeah, I was gonna say, interesting it, stuff, but eh. Could they announce it or do they do they feel at this point that the people who want the graphics performance are going to want a discrete GPU on a desktop? I mean, they, they still could. They, they haven't actually announced any of the specific SKUs. I mean, they, they're showing specific SKUs on those diagrams, so it's obvious now that they exist. But uh, right. it, it's not, I don't, I don't, it's not going to, it's not on their roadmap that I know of, right? So Where does if, this, if they were going to show it, they would have showed it there, I think. Right. I mean, does this pretty much undercut AMD's sort of, we have superior graphics performance? I mean, is this cutting into that severely or, you know, do, or is it just too early? Basically, do we need benchmarks to determine where the the next generation Intel uh, has well uh uh, integrated graphics are comparing to AMD's integrated graphics on their APUs. So on the so there's there's two different answers. On the mobile side, I would say that yes, this will cut into AMD's lead on like laptops. So if you had like a kind of a performance level laptop, but you wanted didn't want discrete graphics, the the AMD Trinity APU was was better than uh, Ivy Bridge, and this will change a little bit um, with. Ivy Bridge, although how much, I'm not 100% sure yet. What doesn't look like will change much is on the desktop side where we're not getting a really big graphics increase from uh, Ivy Bridge to Haswell. So if AMD's lead there should remain, you know, constant would be my okay. guess. Good to know. Overclocker pushes an Intel Haswell Core i7 4770K CPU beyond 7 gigahertz. Uh, OC Aholic, Overclocker Aholic, and spotted an interesting entry in the CPU Z database, writes Tim Very. Essentially, a Haswell Core i7 4770K running past 7 gigahertz. It's a high quality overclock. Uh, I can't even begin to pronounce the name. Uh, R T I U E U I U R E I. Returier? Perhaps an anime reference? Sure. Perhaps a language I cannot speak. Uh, but basically, if it's accurate, um, the overclocker, quote, used a, a B-clock speed of 91.01 .01 and a multiplier of 77 to achieve a CPU clock speed of 7,012.65 megahertz. Uh, Z87 motherboard, 2 gigabytes of G-skill DDR3 RAM. Quote, even more surprising than the 7 gigahertz clock speed is the voltage that the overclocker used to get there in astounding 2.56 volts, according to CPU Z. That's a lot of voltage uh, in a little tiny CPU. 
Uh, it'd be interesting to see as yep. Haswell ships and all the overclockers get a hold of it. If, is this an anomaly? Is this something somebody did with an insane cooling system? Or is it an outright fake? We wait with bated breath. Yep, we won't know for a while. Is there a lot going on with uh, the Silvermont architecture? The the updates for the basically it's Adam for phones and tablets. Silvermont is the name of the architecture. Um, quote: It's been exactly almost exactly five years since the release of the first Adam branded processors from Intel, starting with the Adam two thirty and three thirty, based on Diamondville designs. And if I look around here on the floor, I think I can find a two thirty. Oh no, nope, I take it back. It's holding up speaker cable. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Look, kids, it's just like a doorstop, but different. That's not Remember me when those were down. extremely popular? Wow. Yes. Yes. So, uh, uh, yeah. Silvermont, <laughs> I don't know how much how much detail we want to get into it here. Uh, I, I would recommend people go to PCPro.com and read the, the architecture article that I wrote up. Um, it's a very dramatic move for Intel. Uh, I don't want to overstate it, but I don't feel like we should just say, ah, it's an atom. This is the first time since Adam was introduced that it's being re-architected from the ground up. It's not a simple tweak of what Adam was. It's going from an in-order to an out-of-order architecture. Um, it's it's being deal. built on the 20, yeah, it's been built on the 22 nanometer process. It has a lot of advantages that previous designs didn't have. This is the chip that they designed to go after tablet and cell phone markets specifically. The last chip was something they tried to squeeze into as many different places as they could. Um, mm -hmm. It was an old design. They took off the shelf, kind of tweaked around and played with, and then pushed it into as many places as they could. This is this is a different animal. Um, you know, I won't get into too much of it, but they went to an out of order design, which is a uh, and it's 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 a trade off between efficiency and die space. And they were able right. to uh, use this out of order design to to make the uh, the processor more efficient. Essentially, it can has access to a lot more resources so it can rearrange instructions as they come in um, for more uh, so that there are less pipeline bubbles as if you will. There's, there's less chance of any parts of the processor being less uh, or not fully utilized at any given time. Mm -hmm. And it, it does so at the expense of hyper threading, but they are able to get more performance out of two cores than you could get out of two cores with hyper threading in the same die space, essentially. So that's that's good news. They've they've built it on a module form factor so that um, they'll be able to configure, you know, if they want a dual, a single module that has two cores in it for a phone, they can do that. If they want a two module part with four cores for a tablet, they can do that and they can go up to eight cores. Um, there's details in there about the uh, the point to point interface that they use as a fabric for the entire SOC. There's details about uh, the L2 cache and that kind of thing. There's new instructions. It kind of updates the Atom architecture to support things like AES encryption. A lot of a lot of the security standards, SSE 4.1, SSE 4.2. These are all important things um, because as you in, if you can improve, if you can improve performance, you can get to a sleep state quicker, which is all. Not all, but is what is a major part of what energy efficiency is in processing. You know, one metric is can I keep maximum power low enough and get enough stuff done, or can I get that maximum power up high enough, get so much stuff done that I go to idle quicker, and your your uh, total system power draw is lower over that. You know, total total time. Um, this is competing against ARM, right? This is this is a chip designed to compete against the ARM Cortex A15 and other designs. You know, from Qualcomm and Samsung and NVIDIA and Apple and all that kind of stuff. And they, Intel believes that they have a very compelling part that can run at low frequencies at lower voltages than current ARM parts that can run at higher burst frequencies at lower power while being more efficient. Um, and all we really have at this point is their product information and product guides to, to base that on. Uh, but it, it's it's a very compelling part. They're giving you performance numbers comparing it to the previous generation Atom. Um, they're giving you performance metrics comparing it to uh, quad core competition. So this is a, an interesting one. There's a slide there called "Not all Not all cores are created equal." <laughs> they compare dual core Silvermont to quad core competition. They don't name the competition, but there's not a whole lot of quad core SOCs out there. You could probably figure out which ones they are. Uh, and so they give you two metrics. On the left-hand side, there's a blue bar that says Silvermont performance speed up at one watt core power. So if you're if a person building a system says, I'm okay with one watt core power, 
then you're going to see a 1.5 to 2.1x performance at that same power level. If you mm -hmm. go to the right-hand side and you see these green bars, it's actually a couple more uh, slides down, Burke. There is dual-core Silvermont versus quad-core competition. How much the bars represent here, how much more efficient they are if you are comfortable with the performance levels at one watt that the competition already has. And you're talking about right. efficiency improvements of 1.6 to 3.1x. Uh, and it's, again, these are all their numbers. These are all their metrics. We have to wait for products. And that's maybe the one drawback to what we've seen so far is that these are products that are going to be late 2013 for the tablet space and early 2014 for the phone space. So there's, there's a lot of time left for ARM to come up with, uh, ARM partners to come out with newer designs, uh, even for AMD to come out with their Tamash architecture, which is a very low power x86 quad core SOC type thing as well. So it's it's going to be an interesting an interesting market, right? AMD's parts look very compelling. Um, could they actually be competition to ARM as well? Uh, I think my, my gut instinct is that this first jump at the uh, at the problem from Intel and AMD is going to fall a little short uh, mm -hmm. of, of really kind of being able to take over that market. But I feel like it's a huge step forward for Intel over what Adam has been previously. And I, I would expect, you know, next year CES to have <laughs> cell phone design wins on Intel parts, uh, which ha you know, there's only been a couple of them that have shipped and they haven't been super impressive, right? So right. it's, I don't know, you know, they're not <laughs> the talking only about reason we stuff noticed yet. Because it, it was, it was the Intel branding on a cell phone. Like we shipped one. <laughs> Great. Yes. Um, yeah. That, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, it's it, it's going to be interesting to watch because there's so much activity going on in this space. Uh, another interesting note, uh, AMD to erupt volcanic Island GPUs as early as Q4 2013. Um, <laughs> it's uh, has chosen one of my favorite lines of all time. The rumor is based on a source which leaked a fragment of a slide. Uh, basically, it says there's a new flagship chip called Hawaii, hence the volcanic islands name. Uh, the, you know, originally we thought that uh, Southern Islands would be pretty much holding steady for AMD through the end of 2013. Apparently, AMD is going to drop some new uh, uh, CPUs. Um, it's interesting. So. Uh, we talked a little bit last week about the heterogeneous systems architecture, um, which is dealing with, quote, massively parallel workloads of branching logic tasks, unquote. It usually is when you're dealing with GPU and CPU processing uh, simultaneously or, or serial processing on the discrete GPU. Uh, apparently, the, 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 the line under the graph is a discrete GPU can have serial processing units embedded on it now. So this is an interesting part. Um, this is a really interesting part, you know, for gamers, quote, this might help out with workloads such as AI, which is awkwardly split between branching logic and massively parallel visibility and pathfinding tasks. Um, uh, it's also, uh, as, as this kind of line points out, Josh over at PC Burr suggested a server containing these is essentially add-in card computers. There's a lots of interesting ideas here, like 4,096 stream processors, 16 serial processor cores and eight modules, four geometry engines, 256 TMU, 64 ROPS, 512 gigabytes of DDR3 memory interface, uh, very similar to the PS4, um, and a 20 nanometer gate last silicon fab process, which apparently uh, the Softpedia article that uh, is quoted here, um, uh, fully depleted on silicon on insulator, is apparently amazing on gate last at 28 nanometer and smaller fabrication. Um, and that could be a major process switch for AMD with this processor. Um, yeah. A lot going on here. Almost no Basically, all of this taken from a single slide from a presentation with, with very little accompanying information. Um, so, you know, was it a leak, an intentional leak? Uh, was it an accidental leak? Uh, all I know is that AMD is apparently going to go on the war path in Q4 and more power to them because I want to see CPU prices not climb uh, due to a lack of competition. Uh, odd movement for AMD. They are making, as, as, as Ryan mentioned earlier, they are making AMD branded memory now. Why? Well, I guess, uh, as, as Josh over at PC Per points out, to pad the bottom line, it's, it's easy to contract out memory, throw your name on it. It's brand recognition. It's a brand extension. 
Uh, it's leveraging <laughs> brand. It's leveraging your synergies. Um, but basically, memory is a commodity market. Prices may be going up. Uh, I don't expect AMD to make a lot of money here, but AMD is also uh, has released recently RAM disk software to take advantage of having lots of memory in your PC that maybe you don't need for your basic applications. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> it, free RAM disk software, uh, competitively priced memory, Quote, when dealing with upwards of 16 gigabytes of memory for a desktop computer, sacrificing half of that is really not a big deal unless heavy-duty image and video editing are required, which means if you want a really fast disk, you can create one with uh, AMD's free RAM disk software. So, you know, they're claiming up no, to 20%. Nothing's shattering. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, like, you know, more frames per second with Gamer Series, okay. <laughs> um, are you buying into that? Uh, so this technology more what more well, faster so they're, level loading. They're, they're referencing actual frame rate increases you get while playing a game with that memory because on an APU and they're they're comparing gamer uh, series to entertainment series. Gamer series being uh, like a, a higher frequency memory, so maybe running at two gigahertz memory, and then entertainment series you're running at sixteen hundred or thirteen thirty three. So on an APU you can actually get frame rate increases with higher clock speed memory. It's just... However, if you have yeah. a discrete GPU, you will not sure. see these gains. Okay. Correct. Yeah. They didn't do a very good job of kind of pointing out exactly where this memory is useful. Um, it's useful for APUs, and, and that's why they're kind of doing it. Uh, and I think okay. it's a little bit disingenuous to advertise a 64 gig RAM disk software when the largest memory kit you sell is 16 gigs. So... Just need to buy that four make, <laughs> yeah, it's four by four. So you can't even like you, you can get a 64 gig capable RAM disk software with your memory, but you don't have 64 gigs of memory. So you don't even, you don't even have 32 gigs of memory. I don't know. It's, it's, just, it's a little <laughs> bit weird. Not that big a deal. But, you know, we move on. It bothers you. Let's just let's just say it. it's bothering for some you. reason. For some reason. It's just a little weird. You know, it doesn't bother us. You know, it's not weird. Getting a great deal on cell phone service. We should take a moment. We're, we're, I'm going to segue here gracefully as always ryan and i are the kings of the graceful segue uh you want to save money on your cell phone bill is it starting to make your cable bill look reasonable you should be checking out ting ting is an obs mobile service i'm actually using it for my my wireless modem right now it's pretty cool uh ting is an, M an mvno a reseller of sprint service it's really simple there's no contracts there's no crazy, like, you're going to pay us $200 a month for the rest of your life because they don't subsidize the hardware. You buy the hardware, you sign up for the service, they charge you six bucks a month, and everything's included, you know, and you pay for the amount of data you use. There's no weird bundles. There's no crazy, like, okay, so, you know, if you pay $22 a month, you don't get voicemail, but if you pay $37 a month, you still get, a, you know what I mean, like all that stuff where you're sitting there and, and trying not to slap the person uh, in the kiosk at the mall. Uh, maybe that's yeah. just me, uh, but, but you know, look, you choose extra small to extra, extra large. I choose extra small. That way I have minimal charge if I don't use much or any data or, or, you know, it applies for voice and text messages also. Um, if you use more, you don't get slapped with ridiculous overage fees. They just move you up to the next package. If you, if you, if you use a large amount of data, you pay for the large package. You use an extra small amount of data, you pay for that extra small package if that's what you signed up for. It's cool. And there's no like weird, mysterious items on your bill. It's a very friendly, very transparent company. As somebody who has um, wept, essentially, <laughs> while dealing with uh, pretty much any of the major carriers, uh, since I've been on all of them at one point or another, I got to say, in my one experience of calling up Ting, I was happy. Uh, and I got a, an email follow-up that that had a summary of everything we talked about when we were on the phone. And I was like, this is weird. This is a phone company that doesn't want me to hate them. That's just odd. <laughs> um, you know, Ting credits you. You don't use, uh, if you don't use all of your minutes, if you don't use all of your data, they credit it to uh, the difference on your next bill. They've got to be nice. The software interface is great. It's not designed to to, to obscure information. It's designed to make it accessible. It's designed to basically let you know what you owe or what you don't owe or what you could owe. It's just it's just a really nice company um, and the really nice online support. We would like you. I would like you. Ryan would like you. Leo would like you. Burke would like you. We would all like you to support our sponsor, Ting. You go to twitch.ting.com. It's pretty cool. Check out their savings calculator. Um, 
yes, you will have to pay for phones up front, but it could make a ridiculous difference in the cost you pay per month for your phones. Uh, the whole, like, we'll give you a phone for $100 could be costing you thousands. Check it out, people. Twitch.ting.com. Uh, if you sign up through there, you'll save $25 on your first Ting service. Twitch.ting.com. Save money uh, on your hardware and save a lot of money on your phone bill or your wireless data bill. Check it out, people. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Ting and remind you, twitch.ting.com is the website. If you want to email us a question, we would love to hear it. Uh, actually, we should probably... Well, we, we should probably finish talking about a couple more news stories before we go. <laughs> before, before we get into the viewer questions, uh, Twitch, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv is the email address if you want to send us a question. Um, but this is interesting. Seagate has finally entered the SSD market. There is a Seagate branded SSD. What's the story on that, Ryan? Good, bad, and different? Um, I'm a little it's indifferent another... right now. Alan, Alan hasn't had enough time to do a review on this yet. There are some pretty positive reviews out there, though. Uh, they're using a controller called Link A Media. It's not the first time we've seen this, this controller company. I think Corsair had a drive out uh, that used that abbreviated LAMD. Um, and they're using 19 nanometer flash. They're available in capacities, let's see, up to 480 gigs um you know it's it's not the fastest drive in the world but it's not right. consistent it well it is consistently above average i guess i would say it doesn't have any kind of drop off points doesn't seem to have any kind of low points iops are good it's just um the 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 max kind of sustained sequential reads and writes are a little bit lower than some of the other drives we've seen uh i know a non tech did a review of it and seemed to really like uh both the 600 and the 600 pro I'm trying to see which one. So the 600 Pro goes up to 480, and then mm -hmm. the uh, 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 I think the non-Pro goes up to 400, or the other way around. I think it's the other way around. Um, it's still a six gigabit per second SATA interface drive we're talking about here, um, and it looks like it could be pretty competitive, right? And more competition, the better. And you know, it's it's one of those things where D Seagate, you know, Western Digital tried this. When they right. released their, I forget what it was called now, they had they had a blue series of, of SSDs. And I thought they did pretty well at first, but they kind of backed out very quickly from that market. I'm curious what Seagate plans on doing here, if this is just kind of like a test the waters type of deal. They, they appear to have done a fairly good job. Um, <laughs> and they appear to have modified the firmware a bit so that it's a little bit better than other uh, Link Media drives. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. Uh, Hard SCP noticed uh, that the power consumption was actually uh, 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 down compared to uh, some of the other drives they see. Quote, pulled less power than the rivals. Um, yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious. Seagate's a serious company. They're obviously big in storage, and uh, I am hoping they make a difference. And uh, it will be interesting to see where this ends up. Should we hold off on all of the Haswell motherboard stuff that's coming up? For next year, sure. I mean, yeah. uh, it's just one of those things that's going to snowball for the next three yeah. weeks until we get to Computex <laughs> and all that stuff is released anyway. Um, so we'll 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 maybe in the next couple of weeks try to talk on a couple of them uh, once we have more firm information. Otherwise, I just feel like we're going to repeat ourselves. Right. I mean, you know, it's, it's do you BIOS water cooling on a Z87 motherboard? Z87 motherboards announcements with minimal specs. From all yep. of your favorite vendors. <laughs> Every single one of them, yep. Oh, my goodness. Uh, is, is it safe to say your Oculus? I, 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 I want to give you a chance to talk about Oculus Rift. We quoted your review last week, but I, I just kept thinking, like, man, it just made you want to vomit, right? Is yeah. Pretty much it's Oculus really, it's, Rift in, a, in one line? It's really, it's really unfortunate. It's a very, very cool technology that I am probably the, not a good person to use. Right. And I and I just hope that they figure out technologically how to fix it. Um, right. I was gone all week. Really, I kind of tested it on Friday or Thursday, I guess it was last time. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't it's been a long time. I don't remember. Um, <laughs> I think Friday. And we I was you know, I, I play if you if I'm in a slow environment, it's not a big deal. When I'm in a fast moving environment, it did turn out to be a big deal. And I don't know if it's a technological thing that can be adjusted or if it's going to be something that I need to kind of practice with and kind of force my body to get past. I don't know. We'll just we'll just have to see. Um, 
it turns it's just out too much like football practice. Got to gut yeah. your way through it, son. Ken, I mean, Ken uh, had the same problem. Uh, Tom Peterson kind of had the same problem. So it sounds to me like it's a much more common thing than people thought. And I think what maybe what is happening is people are sitting down, they're, they're using it for 30, sec 30 or 60 seconds, getting up and going, that was the most amazing thing ever, but they're not really trying it out on a bunch of different things. I saw some, um, I saw uh, Ben Kuchera of uh, the Penny Arcade Report talk about a demo using the Oculus that somebody built that simulates you being led up to a guillotine and being beheaded. Off. Yeah. Right. And that's just weird. Right. But he said it was very effective. Like, you know, you, you turn your head around and you look up and you can like see the blade above you type of uh -huh. thing. And, uh, you know, and if you, if you do it well, if you do it, so like there's like a chair or an ottoman sitting in front of you so that you're actually like, you've got your hands on your back and you're leaning over the, the side of it and that kind of stuff while you do it. Um, that's, I don't know if I want that kind of experience. I think that's really <laughs> cool. It's very interesting to talk about the realism and that kind of stuff. Uh, like but then it gets so. into a whole lot of other issues for me. Well, William Gibson's line, the street finds its own uses for things. We should also point out yeah. that the Oculus Rift is is kind of like Google Glass in the sense that it is a developer's version. It is very yeah. early. It's not the final you know, hardware. It is, well, it might be the final hardware, but it's certainly not the final firmware. And developers are still kind of getting up to speed on how to make it the awesome. Although I got to say, I, I did, uh, all I could think was our, our local... Uh, uh, our local state senator, Leland Yee, who spent millions of dollars of California money trying to make sure parents didn't have a choice about what video games for children paid because played because he wanted to decide what uh, what was appropriate for children. Um, I can only imagine that somewhere he is, has written a press release you know, <laughs> condemning this ter terrible abuse. Just ready to hit the send button. I can feel it brewing. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Steven. Has a question about a CS6 upgrade. My wife has recently upgraded to to Creative Suite 6 and is experiencing some GPU errors due to older and incompatible an older and incompatible G4 7600 GT. Uh, it's an earlier i5, 64-bit, 3.2 gigahertz with 16 gigs of RAM and a dedicated OS scratch and storage drives. Awesome. Turn them into SSDs. She'll thank you. <laughs> he says she doesn't do any video processing, and for the most part, it's running Illustrator and her Photoshop concurrently with lots of layers. It seems to be fast enough for her. Using the GPU as an excuse, I'm considering upgrading her to a Haswell i7 system with SSDs. Yes. And taking the i5 for myself. Here are my questions. One, will a Core i7 be any really be any faster than the i5 with this application? Two, would the new Haswell GPU be fast enough to eliminate the need for a separate GPU? Three, if I stick with the i5 or the Haswell GPU proves to be inadequate, what would you recommend for a CS6 compatible GPU that would do the job? And then, of course, there's a list of Adobe's compatible GPUs. Right. Um, you know, and this was, of course, all tested before Photoshop CS6 was released. Um, so the, the 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 list is a bit dated. I think it's safe to say. Um, although yeah. that's, I take that back. Actually, Adobe is supposed to update the list as new cards are tested. Um, okay. You know, quote: If a video card is not listed here but was released after May. 2012 you can't assume the card will work with photoshop cs6 and it's a huge list like you know geforce 8000 9000 100 200 300 400 500 600 series uh quadros radeon 2000 4000 5000 6000 7000 basically all of them um right all the cards so core i5 core i7 has well versus core i5 you know, a modest, not not an incredible boost in in Photoshop performance. I would think in terms of the. User. I mean, the difference is the primary difference that you'll see is is hyperthreading support, right? If it follows with the pattern of Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge, Core i5 will not have hyperthreading. It will be four cores, no hyperthreading. Haswell will be four cores with hyperthreading. Um, there will be cases in uh, heavy effects application that you might see some performance difference there. Um, I don't know how dramatic it'll be. It really depends on, he says, you know, Illustrator and Photoshop concurrently with lots of layers. Uh, if that's the case and you're doing a lot of, uh, not just kind of sitting there creatively thinking about things and being able to switch between layers easily, but you're also doing, okay, let's apply these specific effects and all that kind of stuff to it. Then you might see some performance difference going up to a hyper-threaded part. Um, 
His second question, though, of, uh, will the new Haswell GPU be fast enough to eliminate the need for a separate GPU? I and that see. really depends. That well, depends, it depends entirely on. The filters on and the yeah, time. exactly. Because uh, I think the OpenCL, I think that the filter acceleration in Photoshop is all OpenCL, not mm -hmm. CUDA. Um, and if it's OpenCL, it'll work on AMD, it'll work on NVIDIA, and it will work on Haswell parts, right? So OpenCL support and driver support is going to be a little bit better. Um, so there should be some acceleration even in that regard. But I do think you'll, you'll still get better performance with a discrete solution. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think, I don't know, it really depends. If you're trying to save money, then you might try getting away without upgrading to a discrete card for a little bit. But, uh, you know, I would plan on buying something like uh, 660 Ti or a Radeon 7870 or something like that that's going to have some compute performance in there. You know, maybe even lean, if it is OpenCL, maybe lean towards the, the Radeon solutions and that kind of stuff. Um, I, but, you know, I don't know. So well, I guess I just answered his third question, didn't I? There you have it. <laughs> hey. One last question before we go from another Steven. It's a day of Stevens. He says, I'm to be the proud new owner of a six monitor display. One Samsung 6x23 LCD multi monitor MD230X6. The product is in the mail as I type, but I need some advice. My current video card is a Gigabyte GeForce CTS 670 OC with two gigs of RAM. It has two DVI connections as well as HDMI display port connections. My motherboard is a Gigabyte Z77D3H, which supports Crossfire but not SLI. The place that sold me the six monitors was pushing iFinity 6 graphics cards as the way to connect them to a PC. What I want to know is why can I not connect four through my graphics card and the other two to the onboard graphics controller? I don't want to be playing games across all six monitors, just through the front and center one. The others will have other stuff, dozens of web tabs, my music player, a few other apps, and hopefully a virtual Linux installation. Is what I'm suggesting doable, or should I just get my over myself and fork out the 500 or so extra for an AMD card? Further gushing praise, which Brian and I cannot resist. Thanks in advance for your help. Thank you for a great show. Okay, I can't resist. I'm very much enjoying hearing frame rating. Oh, one more oh. thing. I wanted to read a bit about frame rating, so I attempted to go to the website. Unfortunately, I could find absolutely nothing about it until I realized that what sounded in the Twitch episodes like PC Pro was, in fact, PC Per. It may be an accent thing, but I got very confused <laughs> for tracking the correct website down. Then more confused as I read lots of words and looked at lots of words, but that's another story. PCPER. Dot com. That's where you can find Ryan. That's his day job. I am at Techzilla, which is spelled with a K, T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A dot com. Uh, and this is Twitch, T-W-I-C-H, not Twitch, T-W-I-T-C-H. And you can find that at twit.tv slash twitch. Um, most of the time, you cannot use the discrete graphics on the, or excuse me, the integrated graphics on the motherboard with the discrete graphics on your card. Um, you know, one's on, yes. one's off. Some, so. Sometimes you can using uh, like the Lucid software. It's just not really recommended. Um, <laughs> so I, so with six displays, if you so you can't do a six display gaming scenario with an NVIDIA solution. You can only do up to three, and you have a a fourth uh, what they call um, I don't know a fourth display attached auxiliary display is what they call it. Uh, the Ifinity 6 would allow you to connect six graphics cards all at once. Um, I think if you if you wait, there could be uh, MDT hubs. M M MDT hubs? Uh, basically, they're uh, DisplayPort hubs uh, that would allow you to connect maybe six up to a single DisplayPort connection. But I think, I think your option is to get a second card, right? Um, right. You don't have to get you don't have to get the AMD card. So it depends. If you just want six displays for six windows, you can get a secondary card and it could be like a 660 or a 650 Ti and connect two other monitors to that and then not game on those displays. You game on the ones that your 670 is connected to. And then you shouldn't have a problem, right? You'll still be able to set it up as six different displays in windows that will be able to detect all of them. Um, it will be it will look like a little puzzle for a little while until you arrange everything in the right order. Um, but then you'll, you should still be able to connect, uh, create like an NVIDIA surround object on like the three bottom monitors that are, would all be connected to the GTX 670 
and maybe you have the top two on the left connected to the 650 Ti or whatever it is, and then you know the the fourth one connected to the 670 in the top right, right? So you can just figure out whatever configurations you want to do. Uh, but that does sound like a sweet setup. Um, six monitors. Hope you got a big desk. Hope you measured for that. <laughs> For yeah, sure. I, was gonna say, I think that one comes with its own armature and framework to hang all the monitors off of. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to let uh, Ryan go to sleep after his excellent adventure in Canada. And uh, I got to run off to get a haircut, lest I look even shaggier than usual tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> at Ryan Shrout and at Patrick Norton, if you want to find us on Twitter, PCPer.com is the website for Ryan, P C P E R dot C O M. Uh, I'm at Techzilla, T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A dot com. And I got to say, that is it for this episode of Twitch, T-W-I-C-H, available at <laughs> twit.tv slash T-W-I-C-H. And do us a favor, email us, Twitch, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. And if that doesn't help with the accents or lack thereof or whatever the braces have done to my ability to communicate like an adult, I don't know what else I can do. Perhaps we could put it all in lower thirds. But that <laughs> mocking you didn't hear? was Burke. I could hear him laugh. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this episode of Twitch. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Stroud. We'll see you next week on Twitch.